I'm Carlo. Uh, I'm a partner at uh, Quantum Black, which is the AI practice. Uh, it's part of McKinsey. Um, I, I work across sectors, um, including, um, for example, banking, energy, um, and I also lead uh, Quantum Black Labs, which is the place in McKinsey where we do most of our own um, R&D, building products. Um, and so I'll, I'll, and, 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 and my other role is also to lead some of the actual research we do in the space of AI uh, as part of the essentially McKinsey Tech Council. And so we're gonna be sharing some of the things that we've learned in the last few years. Dave. Hi, Dave Harvey, very nice to meet you. Um, I'm also based in London, with Quantum Black as Carlo does. Uh, I help our clients to scale up their analytics deployments, uh, for example, building up their MLOX practices and capability um, as well as a second hat, uh, working on some of our applied R&D, um, and especially our work within the foundation model space, we call it. Thank you again for having us and uh, giving us the opportunity uh, to share our point of view on what we see as trends in the enterprise ML, and, uh, and what is the potential that we see for essentially foundational models uh, to change the industry. Um, um, Dave, if you move forward, I will skip the introductory page that we that we prepared. <laughs> uh, but I think here, I, ju I just want to say there are four things we want to cover today. We're going to show you a bit more about the um, trends of AI um, in the enterprise. Uh, uh, and uh, we also want to talk about how this is going to be evolving in the future. That's our point of view. Thirdly, we want to show you how essentially foundation models can unlock value and what are some case examples. And fourthly, we are um, uh, trying to talk about some of the risks and some of the actual considerations that enterprise um, and executives should keep in mind as they want to venture and want to start using those models. And so the first, uh, 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 the first piece of, uh, of, of what I'm trying to cover really talks about uh, what is the state of the industry? And in 2018, we uh, did a uh, piece of research where we try to estimate the value of AI um, and machine learning uh, across across geographies, across use cases, across sectors. Uh, and we came up with uh, a 10 to 15 trillion value, which is of course a very sizable, um, very very sizable potential with some of the sectors or a function, for example, uh, capturing a bit more um, compared to others. So for example, the, the marketing and sales, as you can see here, um, or the supply chain. And since we published this piece of work in terms of value, we'll also be running yearly um, a survey with uh, enterprises globally on how they are, um, you know, how they are achieving the value and how they are scaling their own capabilities. And so the last survey we ran was in, uh, uh, end of end of 2022, where uh, uh, we service circa uh, 1500, uh, uh, 15, 1500 participants, and we started to see a few things. One is compared to a 2020, you know, 2018, uh, we uh, see more enterprises investing in in AI, um, in AI capability. But uh, despite this, uh, we can see that the uh, business functions where AI has been used hasn't really increased and it's kind of like leveled off. Um, and, and then when we look at the um, AI leaders, so the, the few enterprises, the subset of enterprises that can really unlock more than 20% EBITDA uh, with AI and compare them with uh, the, the, the other enterprises, uh, we see, uh, uh, gaps and uh, quite a few things that they do uh, differently, and and here we can see three uh, three examples uh, where we see the highest difference. So one is on the data, and on the data we can see they they have the ability to integrate data uh, into models much much quicker, uh, much easier. Um, uh, the second one we see it's on the platforms, and so they use uh, more modern MLOps stacks. They uh, um, uh, some of them have embraced the cloud quite uh, quite extensively, um, 
And the last one, which I think is as important, is they have a full cycle uh, approach. And so they they don't think about uh, building uh, building PLCs or um, small deployments. They they really think about how do we build, deploy, how do we maintain models in production, and how do we embed those models into business processes. So um, uh, as we see the gaps, we've also been reflecting on what are the three things that we see, you know, uh, the industry um, moving. Uh, Moving forward and in a bigger trend. So, so the three things we see here is one is data centric AI. When I joined at the beginning of the conference, I think Alex covered covered this topic fairly well and the idea of the um, uh, the shifts from uh, the model centric to the data centric uh, development um, and deployment life cycles and the idea that data really becomes when uh, you know the place where companies or enterprises need to invest more and more and they are. Uh, the second is the actual maturing of the ML, the ML, ML ops or the ML uh, tech uh, tech stack and, and ecosystems. Um, we still see uh, the industry developing new and new technology in some places, but mostly they've been stable. And with the cloud uh, um, infrastructure uh, really moving up the stack a bit and, and creating more and more uh, platforms for enterprises, uh, some of the platform scaling and, and taking more share of, of, of the industries, we can see this, this, this piece of technology actually maturing quite nicely. Uh, and lastly, I think live, uh, live ops, which is where we, we can see enterprises building capabilities, not only in the space of development, but also in the space of essentially maintenance of, of the models they, 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 they build and create. Um, and and how we when when we started to think about uh, what is happening with essentially foundation models, we we saw that this you know the the shift they they actually um, uh, introduce accelerates each one of those trends. And so uh, in terms of data centric AI, I think I think also Alex was 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 talking about this the idea that we need less data for 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 training. Uh, and a small set of human annotated data can actually uh, uh, increase the uh, uh, some some of the performance of the model uh, in directions we we want the model to be you know the model to be. Um, companies are, are really rethinking about data as their own competitive advantage. They uh, they they understand now that uh, it's not about hiring the best scientists possibly to build the best models, but data. It is really what is going to you know, differentiate them from 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 their competitors, um, and and the idea of possibly even trying you know and wanting to protect this data even more so in the future. In terms of the stack, uh, foundation models will you know uh, of course um, uh, help enterprises to access larger models. Uh, uh, they there is of course a a bit of evolution in industry between. Models you can access via APIs, or models you can access openly or open source. Uh, but, the, but but we see we continue to see enterprises wanting to have options, uh, and APIs still have some complexity, which Dave will will continue to you know will actually cover later in the in the in the talk. Um, and then and then the idea of uh, the MLOps ecosystem being able to uh, 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 you know facilitate some of the fine tuning and prompting approaches that uh, essentially foundational models. Um, uh, need for uh, uh, task tailoring and increased accuracy. And lastly, I think the uh, the the financial models will bring simplicity in in live live ops because we we see that we need less models, possibly for example for a, a number of NLP tasks uh, in the enterprise, but at the same time we we'll also complicate them because we we can only imagine that. Monetary accuracy or the actual performance of financial models may, may be, be, be more complicated in the context of you don't have a single uh, output output metric that you that you're monitoring. And so um, when we start reflecting back to the value, uh, we uh, uh, we essentially thought that uh, there is already a portion of value which is captured by. Uh, Single purpose models have been built in, in the enterprise world uh, where those models have been you know, uh, trained to solve a, 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 um, a very specific problem. 
and been they've been fine-tuned to get the most accuracy out of them so that they are valuable for business to achieve the outcomes that they need. Um, uh, but we, we see that foundation models will uh, essentially accelerate the capture of the total value they initially thought about in expanding the, um, in enhancing the performance of the models that have been already deployed in solving those problems, as well as possibly um, expanding the reach of, of those models uh, within the enterprise as, as they, they multi-model can cover more of that. But more importantly, we could also already imagine a new set of uh, problems that before were not possible and the foundation models can, can solve. And therefore, uh, we, we at the moment, we're also thinking about, okay, what is the additional value pools? What is the additional value uh, that we now can unlock that we couldn't really imagine uh, four years ago? And I think we can see here some example of use cases as many of you, I'm sure, uh, they're quite familiar with in terms of like uh, crafting content and so all the marketing uh, things that, you know, and then in the marketing uh, enablement that you can get, uh, knowledge access, um, writing code, and, and the idea of uh, uh, even um, changing the way uh, engineers, for example, um, uh, work. Uh, and we've seen this already with um, some of the copilot, um, uh, co-pilot uh, adoption in numbers, and, and also the idea of expanding R&D. Um, and, and so the, the ability to, to explore uh, a much broader space, uh, for example, uh, new, uh, new chemical structure. Uh, and so I think the, um, um, as, we, as, we, um, as we thought about these problems, uh, we'll, we also thought, thought about some, you know, what, what are concrete examples of, of companies already using financial models, you know, today, and what are what are the risk and what are the complexity we see in those, in, you know, when we think about enterprises uh, moving towards those models. So I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Dave, um, so you can um, bring us forward. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Carla. So we've looked at these broader trends happening in the industry. But in our remaining time, let me zoom us in to look at how does this play out within an enterprise context. So people, so we see there's big promise of value from foundation models. People would often ask us, well, do we see enterprises really capturing that value today? And whilst the answer is that this is early and emerging, there are examples of some very powerful deployments that we see. Let me take a couple of minutes just to talk through this one uh, from the biotech space. This was a biotech working to accelerate the identification of new drugs. They had millions of microscopy images and small molecule compounds. And they were using traditional feature extraction methods to identify potentially therapeutic compounds. Now this was, it was highly iterative and manual processes, which were limited in their capability. They were looking to innovate. They were primarily looking to increase their efficiency and to improve the probabilities of success of experiments. What did they do? Well, they used image and chemistry foundation models to do the first analysis, to create multidimensional embedding vector representations of images and small molecules structure. These embeddings fed into downstream traditional ML pipelines for clustering, for identification, and then prioritization of compounds that may be therapeutically relevant. Now, the FMs are much more powerful than the traditional approach. They were able to do a much more complete and holistic uh, exploration of the solution space. And because of this, they can create far more hits and higher quality hits. And the overall impact shows out in improved performance and improved productivity. So in performance, they were getting over a thousand therapeutically relevant lead hypotheses. And these were higher quality hits with more information uh, or more informative definition of the phenotypes. Uh, these were much more useful for designing successful experiments. And in terms of productivity, the automation in this process meant that they went from analysis time of months of highly iterative manual effort down to days, plus knock-on benefits downstream 
in the actual delivery of experiments. So if the opportunity is big and players are already really leveraging these, is this the opening of the floodgates? Will we see foundation models transforming most enterprises by the end of the year? Well, it's not a simple overnight transition for most enterprises. If they want to leverage foundation models at scale, there are a number of capabilities that need developing, see the top of this page, as well as a number of policies and risk frameworks that need updating. And the latter, those policies and risks, is probably the most significant piece. But let me quickly just talk across the top of this page. So first of all, our ML protocols need updating in several ways. Our development workflows dramatically change from iterative model development with lots of feature engineering through to prompting and fine tuning massive models. Live ops, as Carla mentioned earlier, the monitoring and maintenance of solutions will change a lot as we move from many small models that we built ourselves to fewer larger models that we have received. As our protocol changes, correspondingly number two, our talent capabilities have to update. So we need data scientists familiar with deep learning frameworks, we need uh, MLEs who are comfortable navigating uh, and managing the size of models, our translators who we've spent the last years up, upskilling and updating well, suddenly they need to, to reskill and upskill again for foundation models to be able to identify opportunities and lead projects. Number three here, we described earlier the evolution in the ML tooling ecosystem, and that's only going to accelerate around the foundation model space. So um, tools to optimize auto labeling, fine tuning, optimizing model selection. We need to make sure that our people have the right tools. Uh, to optimize their workflows. And then finally, number four on the right, uh, we need to be able to provision sufficient compute for these large models, both for the training and for serving. So there are capabilities that need work to build and develop. But number five at the bottom here, uh, there are risks and policies that need updating. And this is probably the biggest barrier for enterprise adoption at scale in the near term. Uh, the question list uh, is long. I mean, how do I demonstrate regulatory compliance when I didn't build the model? What are the IP and legal considerations? How do I manage my data risks? How can I fulfill my obligation to explainability? Can I assure performance? Can I avoid bias? The list goes on and on. Uh, and it is a daunting list as people start to wrap their head around it. So there's big promise of value and disruption. Yet yeah, there is much work that needs to be done before most enterprises are ready to deploy these at scale. Well, in which case, what should businesses be doing now in the coming months as they look to get going? Now, one caveat, of course, this list here is not prescriptive, true for all businesses. But as we talk to our clients, uh, we hear many of them uh, exploring at least uh, these five common questions. First of all, um, they're considering where the value is and what this emerging capability means for their value chain, for their sector. How big a disruption could this be? How significant could this be for them? Secondly, uh, they think through their policies and postures to this emerging tech. Uh, is it critical that um, you're a fast mover and ahead of this curve? Or can you afford to be a little bit more cautious and be a follower? Third, what capabilities and partnerships will I need for the longer term? And how do I start exploring and developing those now? Fourth, how do I set guardrails and controls that need to be in place to protect trust as I start out and as I move towards scale? And then fifth, should I start experimenting now? If so, uh, where do you experiment? And what do you learn, want to learn and demonstrate from those? Now, we were conscious as we put this side in, there is a danger that uh, this could imply that it is um, straightforward, clear cut uh, steps that everybody should be taking. So as we draw towards a close, we did want to acknowledge and recognize that this is an emerging and a rapidly evolving space. And that therefore there is much uncertainty. 
Now, here is an initial list of big open questions to watch in the coming months. Uh, there are clearly many, many more uh, on top of this, but here's are some that we're going to be watching and actively working and researching with various partners. Let me just pick a few of these. So the first one there, uh, where will foundation models truly displace traditional? Uh, where will the performance cost trade-off tip in favour of foundation models? Where will explainability requirements allow foundation model use? The third on this list, what guardrails will emerge for foundation model use in this rapidly evolving space? Um, what will happen in regulation? What industry standards will be emerging? Fourth here, uh, we will invariably see many, many new players emerge. But where will most of them be? Who will the winners be? Uh, will there be many moving in to develop new foundation models? For sure, we already see an explosion of startups building applications on top of foundation models. What will be the changes in the enabling infra and tooling side? Now, for time, maybe let me just jump down to number seven there. What will be the impact on our workforce? both on our technical practitioners, but also on the whole workforce writ large across the enterprise, if the deployment of these models truly scaled. Now, this list goes on and on, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on other things that should be shared uh, and added onto this. It's been a pleasure talking to you today on such an interesting, exciting topic. Look, we're looking forward to taking your questions uh, in this wider forum now. And also, we're really happy if you want to reach out to the InTouch offline.